This is the bit. Here, can you see me?
I, I call to order the informal meeting of the plenary to hear a joint briefing on Syria by the Special Envoy of the Secretary General for Syria, Mr. Staffan de Mistura, Under Secretary General for Humanitarian Affairs and Emergency Relief Coordinator, Stephen O'Brien, and Assistant Secretary General for Human Rights, Ivan Simonovic. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, excellencies, the conflict in Syria is now well into its fifth year. It has contributed to a crisis that has brought violence, death, displacement, destruction, regional instability, and unimaginable suffering for the people of Syria. Yesterday, we marked World Refugee Day, and it's worth bearing in mind that this crisis accounts to almost 17% of those displaced across the total globe. Over the past few months, I've had the opportunity to meet some of these displaced people in camps in uh, Ganshatseb in Turkey and in the Satari camp in Jordan. I have also discussed these matters with the relevant national and local authorities and witnessed leading humanitarian actors working towards a better future at the World Humanitarian Summit. In this context, and given the role which the General Assembly has played on this crisis as far back as 2012, I believe it's critical that this Assembly remains fully abreast at the most recent developments in Syria. In December last year, many of us were encouraged to hear that a new diplomatic effort launched in Vienna was providing a glimmer of hope for a comprehensive solution. Resolution 2254, adopted by the Security Council on the 18th of December 2015, expressed support for a Syrian-led political process that established, quote, credible, inclusive, and non-sectarian governance, unquote, which uh, within a target of six months sets a schedule and process for drafting a new constitution and for free and fair elections pursuant to the new constitution to be held within 15, 18 months and administered under the supervision of the United Nations. Since then, it has been a case of progress alongside setbacks. A momentum to achieve these goals and others, including those of, on humanitarian access, must not be lost. We must not fail the people of Syria any longer. I am therefore grateful that we are joined today by Staffan de Mistura, uh, Stephen O'Brien, and Mr. Uh, Simonovic on the latest developments on efforts to achieve the objectives set out on Resolution 2254. Following briefings from the three speakers, I will open the floor for member states to, for remarks and questions, not exceeding three minutes, and we have a time limit. We have to end this uh, session uh, before 11.30. I now give the floor to Mr. Staffan de Mistura. He's joining us via video conference from Geneva. Um, the President, dear uh, the colleagues and uh, delegates and representatives of the General Assembly, thank you for this opportunity, first of all. I think the timing uh, the, is very appropriate and it's a timing in which we need to look at the situation in Syria more deeply. Because it's crunch time, it's a moment of uh, verification. And I want therefore to thank you for the invitation to join both Stephen O'Brien and Ivan Simonovic at this meeting. I will obviously defer to both Stephen and to Ivan on the subjects of their own competence and the professional knowledge. And I will still refer to those linkages that exist between my own mission on behalf of the General Assembly and the Security Council and of the Secretary General have with the humanitarian and human rights link. In other words, everything seems to be connected. And 
as I have been saying in the past, when we look at Syria, it is as if we are looking at the moment at the table with three legs. One is uh, the cessation of hostilities, the reduction of violence. The other one is the humanitarian access to all Syrians, wherever they are. And the third one is the political process or political transition, as we all now recognize it as uh, to be, uh, in order to maintain uh, each one of the three legs moving and staying. Since I last briefed you, briefed you, in fact, through your own initiative, Mr. President, and last November, in fact, there's been quite a lot of uh, changes and significant, frankly, developments. And we need to recognize that because the moment when we only look at the glass half full and or half empty, and in this case, we can see that it is um, been some developments which should give us hope and in addition to hope also more energy to push forward because in Syria a glass half full is not enough. Number one, we have had the establishment of the International Support Group. Now this is co-chaired by the US and Russia Federation, includes all regional actors and beyond, including Iran and Saudi Arabia. This one year ago was unsinkable. We didn't have any contact group. So that's a move in the right direction and certainly in support to what we are trying as a mission. Second, we have had two Security Council resolutions endorsing a political roadmap and a timetable. We didn't have any. We just had the Geneva communique and some generic Security Council resolutions. These two, in particular 2254, are very, very precise. Three, we have had four months long cessation of hostilities, of which the first two months were almost 90%. They were co-sponsored by the ISFG and in particular by the two ISFG co-chairs, Russian Federation and the US. And that saved many lives. We have been counting how many are dying or used to die every day and how many, luckily, were spared during that period. We have had two task forces, and they are now in function here in Geneva, of the ISSG, where the international community is in a position, if they want and when they want, and they've been doing it quite often, in pushing forward on improved access and preserving the cessation of hostilities or limited, limiting when the cessation of hostilities was in major danger. And there has been a greater international cooperation on the fight against Daesh. Just look at the latest developments, when in fact from the north and from the south, there have been in both cases some military moves towards Raqqa. Difficult, but taking place. There has been also a progress on building a more cohesive opposition as you know, many of us have been complaining and uh, worried about the fact that the opposition was excessively divided or certainly not on the same page. There has been now the High Negotiation Commission and there has been also a uh, understanding by everyone that uh, the instructions I got from the UN Security Council Resolution 2254 is for uh, a broadly inclusive, I repeat, uh, inclusive, and representative political process and progress, even if timid, in trying to reach some kind of common understanding or commonalities. That's what we've been doing during the last two rounds, depending on how many we want to count them, but we count them too, of intra-Syrian talks which have been resuming in Geneva under the UN auspices in January. This, in addition to the fact that much thanks to the ISFG push and the tireless work of the UN teams on the ground that has produced, and frankly, the cooperation of the Syrian authorities have been uh, the providing uh, the quite more access than we used to have to the besieged areas. Remember, one year ago, Mr. President, the number of besieged areas reached by the UN was zero. 
This year, we are reaching, and you will hear it from Stephen O'Brien, more than around 300,000 people in besieged areas. The delivery of emergency aid is obviously for the Syrian people the first sign that whatever talks or meetings we have in Geneva do have an impact on the everyday life, including the reduction of violence. All this to prove that when the international community is having a common line, we can deliver on all fronts the political, the humanitarian, and the reduction of violence. Yet, we are facing now, and let's be frank, in spite of what I've been telling you, now, while I'm talking to you, a difficult moment. The cessation of hostilities, which started very well, and quite impressively, almost within hours, 72 hours, you could see a change, radical change in the level of violence, and which was particularly effective during the first two months, and which led to a drastic reduction of casualties, has been now heavily challenged, especially in and around Aleppo, Idlib, Latakia, and some of the areas surrounding in the neighborhood of Damascus but it's been holding in many other areas. So we are not in the breakdown of the cessation of hostilities, but an area of danger of this becoming worse and therefore reaching to that. So far, that's not the case, but we are concerned. And the access to besieged and hard to reach areas has definitely improved. And again, I will leave it to Stephen to elaborate on that. But of course, this is not near the pace and the volume required to address the needs of all Syrians. Plus, there is one area where we are concerned, and we have been saying it ourselves and at the ISSG, there's been a trend in the last weeks that the very areas where there has been a breakthrough of delivering humanitarian aid to besieged areas have been then shelled before and after the convoys have reached or departed. And that's been a bad news. In adopting Resolution 2254, coupled with 2268, the Security Council has made it clear, abundantly clear, that only a negotiated political solution can bring an end to this conflict, not a military victory or a military defeat, which is clearly not possible for anyone. Five years, almost six years, has proven that this is impossible and unreachable by anyone. The resolution further acknowledged the close link between a nationwide ceasefire and a parallel political process. Let me clarify, and I, I know you, you all feel the same. There is a connection between the confidence-building measure of a cessation of hostilities which then favors and helps the access of humanitarian aid and the feeling among those who come to Geneva to discuss a political process that they can justify to their own people, to the Syrian people, that sitting in Geneva for a month, three weeks, and talking about political process is all immediately, at the same time, bringing some benefit for the Syrian people. Progress, therefore, on the cessation of hostilities will drastically improve the conditions on the ground, leading to significant scaling up of humanitarian delivery. When there is less fighting, humanitarian delivery has more access. More access means more confidence. More confidence means also for the people who are wanting to look at the political process to believe in it. This important interlinkage which is not a precondition, but an interlinkage, has been constantly very present in our mind. And that's why the two ISSG task forces are so important to progress, because they are conducive to making our intra talks meaningful and credible. Since the ministerial level ISSG meeting in Munich on the 17th of February, the UN and the partners were able to reach, and you will hear it from Stephen, so I won't go into detail, 16 besieged locations, many more than once. 
I'm acutely aware that the access we have today can easily end tomorrow and that we should avoid the syndrome of stop and go, stop and go. Or good news one day, one day before we have a meeting in Geneva and then bad news between that meeting and the next. So that's what, uh, why we believe that what is required and is fair to request is safe, unhindered and unimpeded access as the Security Council resolution unanimously referred to. We are also conscious, however, and so are the Syrians when we talk to them, and as you know, we do meet them regularly, that only progress on the political front will deliver a sustainable, long-term solution and therefore ensure the immediate lifting of all sieges and everything else that is affecting the Syrian people. So, let's talk about talks for a moment. The last round was concluded on the 27th of April. During that period of two weeks, both the government of Syria and the opposition spelled out their own respective visions for a political transition in greater detail. Now the good news, most encouragingly, is that for the first time, frankly, at this stage, for the first time all sides, I repeat all sides, accepted the need for a political transition. Yet, while common ground exists, particularly on what Syria would look like with some shared principles, disagreements do remain stark on the question over the devolution of any type of presidential authority. While the opposition insists on the creation of a transitional governing body with full executive powers, as indicated, as you know, in the Geneva Communique, the, um, the government of Syria envisages and suggests instead the formation of a broad-based government of national unity. Whatever the name or whatever the shape is eventually decided upon by the Syrians, it needs to reflect a commitment to a real political transition. And that's where the challenge is with us as UN and as governments, in order to try to see whether we can find a formula by which we can respect both the Geneva Communique and the Resolution 2254. Drawing from those discussions, I have further identified a list of core issues to be addressed in greater detail in the next round, which, as you know, I have postponed until I have some form of reassurance that at least the two co-chairs may have a common ground on which we can start working. You may argue, why do we need the two co-chairs? The answer is, the two co-chairs were able to actually prepare the ground for the cessation of hostilities, which was then regionally accepted by everyone, including in Syria by the government of Syria and by the opposition forces. So when they do agree, and when the ISSG does agree, we do have a critical mass on which the UN can then provoke, produce the follow-up and the sustainable solution. So I've been identifying a group, a list of core issues to be addressed in greater detail at the next round. When? I know a question will come up. Well, I will consider that during July, not yet, not now, because it is premature in view of the current discussions and the current situation. We have, summar we have summarized all this in what we call the mediator summary, and in particular Annex 1, which I'm sure you have access to, being a document which has been circulating among the Security Council members as well. These include defining the composition of the relevant transitional governance arrangement, how to reform the military security apparatus, and how to practically establish a calm, neutral environment that assures the safety of all during the political transition. IASFG ministers on 17th of May did encourage the parties to re-engage constructively on this basis. And my team has since embarked on a series of technical talks 
while waiting for the official formal talks to be played, with the parties in order to get deeper on these very issues ahead of the next formal round of talks. Meetings have already been held in Moscow, Cairo, and are planned for the next week in Riyadh, and also in Damascus. Meanwhile, we have continued our sustained engagement with the Women's Advisory Board and civil society organizations, which are important constituencies that have not been shy at all from open debate among them on the very challenging topics, including governance. And that's exactly what we hope to hear. Mr. President, having said that, political talks cannot proceed as I did say already effectively, while hostilities are escalating and civilians are starving. In April, we have been seeing a marked deterioration in the situation on the ground, both in terms of fighting and in terms of humanitarian access. But as you will probably, surely hear from UFG O'Brien, this was partly due to, uh, not partly due to airdrops, and after several really very bad weeks for the humanitarian access in the country, we have seen recently substantial progress. The progress has been helped, of course, by the effective diplomatic work some members of the task force, including systematic efforts, and we have to give them credit, both by the two co-chairs, Russian Federation and the US, but also the courageous and commendable work by our humanitarian colleagues on the ground and partners, and some increased, indeed, cooperation by the government of Syria. Unfortunately, and despite sustained efforts by the two co-chairs, I cannot say exactly the same as regard to the cessation of hostilities. While the overall level of fighting continues to be below, I repeat, below the level prior to the ceasefire in January, there has been a worrisome escalation of fighting in several areas. Meanwhile, ISSG statements have progressively reinforced the linkages with the political process and the need to advance on the agenda set out by Resolution 2254. Yet parallel discussions among key international regional players have yet to yield an understanding on the speed and depth of the political transition. The dilemma remains the same, how to ensure meaningfulness and irreversibility of the political transition and at the same time a widely acceptable process without causing abrupt shock, trauma, catastrophe in the system in Syria. Humanitarian access will remain the most pressing and obvious visible way by which the UN and the international community can, must make a difference on the ground. Syrians are expecting this and more of this from us. They receive news of missing people, they receive news of arrest, they need to receive news on their missing persons and on those imprisoned or detained. And they need to hear that the bombardment shelling is reduced or completely stopped. That's what they are hoping and asking us every time we meet them. And we do expect that we break through the misplaced logic of a military solution. And we do so without any detail. No reason to wait for new developments to take place. It has been abundantly proven that any type of uh, military solution is uh, out of question. And no one can think or dream to gain time hoping to think that uh, that will be making a big difference in terms of a military solution. Some argue that we should not be bound by artificial deadlines. For instance, August, which has been a date indicated. August is an artificial deadline, but it's a serious deadline. It has been indicated both by the two co-chairs. It does prepare for a new General Assembly debate, which is unavoidably going to touch on Syria. 
and uh, it is also the last uh, general assembly on which the Secretary General Ban Ki Moon will be reporting on uh, Syria, and certainly the opportunity for all of you, all of us, to prove to the world that uh, the movement that has taken place can have a positive development. So the August timeline is very much present for us in view of the September timetable. The window of opportunity is coming quickly to close unless we maintain alive the cessation of hostilities, we increase the humanitarian aid, we come to some common understanding of our political transition so that we can have, hopefully in July, intra-Syrian talks, not about principle, but about concrete steps towards political transition. This is what we are aiming at, and that's what we hope we will be able to reach. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you very much. To Stefan de Mistura, I now give the floor to Mr. Stephen O'Brien uh, to continue the briefing. Uh, Mr. President, Excellencies, I wish to thank the President of the General Assembly for calling uh, this meeting and taking this comprehensive approach to a briefing from the political, the human rights and the humanitarian perspectives and providing the Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs the opportunity to brief on the humanitarian situation in Syria I particularly thank uh, Stefan de Mistura, Special Envoy, for his comprehensive and detailed uh, briefing just now, and I look forward to uh, my remarks being complimented by uh, Ivan Simonovic on the human rights aspects. In Syria, a conflict that started off as civil unrest in March 2011, it has since transformed into an ugly and brutal war characterized by extreme levels of violence committed against civilians in a climate utterly devoid of protection in many parts of the country. A climate in which civilians have endured relentless attacks, mass displacement from their communities, the decimation of their homes and critical infrastructure, and the despicable medieval besiegement tactics for years. In the Syria crisis, the facts speak for themselves. Hundreds of thousands killed and well over a million injured. Life expectancy in Syria has dropped by, wait for it, imagine this, 20 years. Approximately half of the population has been forcibly displaced, 6.5 million of them inside the country, in addition to the half a million Palestinian refugees. Overall, 13.5 million people are left in urgent need of humanitarian and protection assistance. The conflict in Syria has destroyed the country's social and economic fabric, eroding development gains made over several generations. 80-80% of Syrians now live in poverty. Nearly 9 million Syrians are food insecure amidst rising prices and food shortages, and 2 million children have been forced out of school altogether. We should never lose sight of the immeasurable human impact of this crisis, the trauma and emotional toll on civilians, particularly young people, too long exposed to living in a climate of violence and fear, a generation lost to the normalcy of violence and hatred and no access to education, which is the only route out and to hope. Warring parties have displayed a brazen and brutal disregard for international humanitarian and human rights law. Their use of indiscriminate and disproportionate attacks, including the use of barrel bombs and other explosive weapons in populated areas, these are the primary cause of civilian deaths and injuries. Civilian infrastructure and basic services, including people's homes, health clinics and hospitals, schools, markets and settlements for internally displaced people, are relentlessly attacked, even now collectively punishing hundreds of thousands of civilians. Medical facilities in particular have been targeted in attacks with Physicians for Human Rights recording some 365 attacks on 259 medical facilities and the death of 738 health workers attacked since the start of the conflict. Amid this onslaught of violence, Thousands of civilians in Syria are forced to face 
impossible choices each day. Whether to flee to uncertainty and possible danger or risk being killed at home. Run to where you can get a possible education for your children after years of no chance, no hope. Just as any of us in this room would, faced with such an impossible choice. Almost five million civilians have made this choice, fleeing to neighboring Lebanon, Jordan and Turkey, some to Iraq, and relatively few, relatively few, but nonetheless over one million to Europe. My deepest gratitude goes to the local authorities, to the governments and to the host communities in these neighboring countries for their generosity, their hospitality and their solidarity, which they have shown to their neighbors in need. So Mr. President and Excellencies, Nonetheless, desperation means that more and more people are prepared to literally be taken for a ride by unscrupulous traffickers and make the perilous journey to Europe across the Mediterranean, where far too many continue to die. In 2016 to date, running at more than the rate for 2015, with an average of two full passenger jets per month of people drowning in the Mediterranean right in Europe's backyard. For the sake of humanity as well as security, we need to find a better, more sustainable way forward for the wider international community to share the responsibility in hosting Syrian refugees. Mr. President and Excellencies, while the conflict inside Syria has shown us some of the worst in humanity, it has also in some ways brought out the very best in many people. In my visits to Syria and the region, I've spoken to dozens of Syrians who have retained hope despite their desperation. I've witnessed the deep generosity of families in Syria, Lebanon, Turkey, Iraq, Egypt and beyond who are sharing their modest accommodation with displaced families. I've met volunteers and staff of Syrian NGOs and grassroots organizations, of the Syrian Arab Red Crescent, of civil defense teams and the staff of hospitals, clinics and schools throughout the country who live and all too often die by their commitment to ensure the survival of their fellow citizens. And I've seen it in the thousands of United Nations staff and humanitarian partners on the ground who risk danger every hour of the day to get help to people who need it most. And I thank the Russian Federation, especially their Damascus diplomatic mission, for their good offices in facilitating many of the channels of communication with the Syrian government, which enable negotiations to be safely concluded for access. Aid agencies are working day and night to assist millions of Syrians affected by this conflict month after month, whether from within Syria or cross-border assistance. This year alone, we have reached up to 5.8 million people with food assistance each month and delivered over 5 million medical treatment. We are doing all we can, but we require the resources to keep up our efforts. Today, only one quarter of the appeal for the UN and its partners life-saving work in Syria is funded. I do thank the donors for their generous contributions so far, many of which were made at the London Pledging Conference for Syria and the region. But I urge them and others to step up their financial support to humanitarian response. Pledges are one thing, but frankly, it's your cash that matters. It's that which buys the programs and the services that actually save and protect innocent lives. And following London, we're heavy on pledges and promise words, but frankly, light on cash. Hard, real cash. That's to say, we need your pledges to convert to cash now. And Mr. President and Excellencies, the courageous efforts of humanitarians, and let me pay tribute to the enormous courage of the humanitarians on the ground, UN, its partners, international and local. They are there to help people in desperate need should and this should not hide the fact that insecurity, widespread fighting, bureaucratic obstacles and other restrictions put in place by all the parties continue to significantly hinder the delivery of aid across Syria. Over 90 humanitarian workers have been killed since the start of the conflict, while 29 United Nations staff members continue to be detained or are missing as I speak. A staggering 590,000 civilians inside Syria are besieged, the vast majority of them by the government of Syria. Civilians in Daraya, Douma, Foa and Kafraya, Deir Zor and other besieged areas continue to face barrel bombs, sniper fire and shelling. The barbaric use of medieval siege tactics is morally reprehensible 
and has no place in the 21st century. The United Nations and its partners have reached over 330,000 people in besieged areas in the first half of this year, and each month we reach around a third of the total number of besieged people, compared to just a small fraction of that last year. This does represent a small degree of progress, but it is a long way from the sustained and unconditional access that we require. Malnourished babies, the chronically ill, require sustained support over time, not one-off deliveries. Over three quarters of people who are stuck in hard to reach areas remain beyond our reach due to the combination of factors mentioned, I've just mentioned. People are trying to survive in these areas day by day without the basic necessities of life. Parties to the conflict, principally non-state armed groups and listed terrorist groups, repeatedly cut services, collectively punishing entire villages and cities in the process. We are particularly concerned for those people living in the ISIL held areas who live under daily oppression human rights abuses, as you'll hear no doubt more in a second, and terror. Even when we do gain access, over 650,000 life-saving medical supplies have been excluded or removed from convoys over the past two years, including over 150,000 in 2016 alone. The vast majority have been removed by the Syrian authorities. The range of removed, removed items frankly defies belief from infant malnutrition treatment, baby milk powder. What dual use is that, for goodness sake? To medicines to stop women bleeding after childbirth. Medicine and other relief must not be turned into a cynical political bargaining chip. International humanitarian law is very clear on this. The sick and wounded must be given the medical care they require. Medical personnel and medical facilities must be protected in all circumstances. There is no justification to break these laws. The bottom line is that the current levels of access throughout the country still leave many civilians starving and without proper medical care. Medicines, food and water are not and must not be made into bargaining chips or favours that the parties to a conflict can grant or deny at will. They are basic necessities that lie at the essence of survival and the right to life. It is simply unacceptable that parties to the conflict continue to impede and frustrate our efforts to reach people. The political track and the talks do not and cannot be, or indeed they cannot make, conditional the provision of humanitarian access and relief. But safe, full, unimpeded access does give an enabling and confidence-building context, not least as the brave negotiators, uh, not least led by the humanitarian coordinator and his colleagues, uh, can make their agreements stick, as we've heard from Stefan de Mistura. And as he has rightly said, we, the humanitarians, must, as a matter of law, have safe, unimpeded access to all those in need. And we have the right to act independently, impartially, and neutrally. No stop-go, no conditionality. And we need the full and sustainable access. We are a long, long way from that, from compliance by the Syrian government, in particular, with this law. It's a law which it has signed up to. The efforts of the Security Council, the International Syria Support Group, Individual member states, as well as many Syrians, have shown what can be achieved when there is the political will to resolve problems. Our collective engagement must remain steadfast to bring the prolonged and bitter suffering of the Syrian people to an end. The international community must demonstrate its collective leadership in the following areas to help bring about a long overdue end to this crisis. One, ensuring the protection of civilians and civilian infrastructure, including medical facilities. Two, bringing an end to the sieges and ensuring freedom of movement for civilians. Three, ensuring that the parties to the conflict abide by their international legal obligations and by Security Council resolutions to facilitate humanitarian access to all people in need without discrimination. Four, considering all possible avenues to ensure accountability, to show perpetrators of violations that the international community will not tolerate such action in Syria or indeed elsewhere. Five, stepping up financial support to the humanitarian response, as I have urged, and six, respecting the non-political nature of humanitarian aid. And we remain committed and ready to deliver humanitarian aid through any possible modality for civilians in desperate need. However, let me be clear that humanitarian action cannot be a substitute for political action. Only a negotiated political settlement will and can resolve this crisis. And we must show the people of Syria that the world has not forgotten them or their plight 
and indeed the plight of their country. Not through more words of solidarity, but through immediate and concrete political action that brings an end to this futile cycle of violence and misery. And hard cash for meeting immediate needs, humanitarian needs, is now needed. The future of this and coming generations is on the line, and the credibility of the international community is at stake. Thank you. Thank you, Chancellor Secretary General uh, Stephen O'Brien. I now give the floor to Mr. Ivan Simonovic uh, for his part of the briefing. Mr. President, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, five years of suffering, over 250,000 people killed, half of the population displaced. It is hard for most of us to process the scale of the violence in Syria. So I begin with four stories of individuals suffering at the hands of various parties to the conflict. The first story is of a 15-year-old and a 16-year-old who together with seven other civilians were killed on 19th April when airstrike by government forces or their allies hit the fish market in the busiest part of Kafernabel in Idlib governorate. The second is of a 16 years old Yazidi girl. Like so many other women in her community, she was abducted from Iraq and then she was sold into sexual slavery in Syria. She was forced to use violence to escape. And even when she was free, she had nowhere to go. So she returned to house where other Yazidi girls were held and abused. Against all odds, she managed to escape again and rejoin her community. Unfortunately, that community facing what may amount to genocide is wise enough to refuse to allow their girls to be stigmatized by sexual crimes. But thousands of others are still being held, raped, and tortured. The third was also a teenager, a 16 years old boy. He was accused of homosexuality. This young man was killed by ISIL. He was stoned to death. Another boy, just 15, was on his way to school. Despite the violence and chaos, he was brave enough to try to sit for the exams he had that day. But when he reached the government checkpoint in Deir el-Zur, he was arrested and taken by one of the military security branches in Damascus. He was tortured to death, just 15. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the sixth year of horror for Syrians. So many have suffered torture, destruction and death. Their story is no longer news. It may be difficult to grasp the effect of millions of rights violations in the Syrian conflict, but it is plain to see they must be stopped. The crisis is rooted in human rights violations. It began with peaceful protests, young people across Syria were exercising their fundamental human rights to freedom of opinion and freedom of assembly. This should have led to reforms and peaceful political development. Instead, a violent crackdown unleashed the unspeakable violations we see today. Terrorists gained ground in this lawless environment. They further infringed on rights of the Syrian people. Parties to the conflict, including some from outside Syria continue to blatantly disregard human rights and humanitarian law. They are launching indiscriminate attacks. They are using disproportional force. They are killing civilians with airstrikes, rockets, barrel bombs, and more. They are sending fighters into heavily populated areas. And the parties are destroying protected sites, the schools, hospitals, and other public buildings. We are especially alarmed by destruction of medical units. Last month, the Secretary General condemned the 360 attacks on 250 medical facilities since the early days of the conflict. Several hundred medical workers have been killed. This May alone, we documented at least seven more incidents of parties damaging or destroying medical units. The result is this. In parts of Syria, even if there may be some possibility of medical help, civilians are too scared to seek it. Hundreds of thousands of civilians remain trapped in the besieged area across Syria. 
many innocent civilians are at the risk of starvation. Across Syria, a very large number of persons are being subjected to arbitrary detention and deprivation of liberty in the most appalling conditions. Many are tortured and many die while in detention. The fate of several thousand missing persons must be clarified. These descriptions are the living nightmare of Syria's people today. The only way to instill hope for tomorrow is to insist on full respect for human rights as we press for a political solution. Ceasefires and humanitarian relief can be augmented with other steps. These release uh, of hostages uh, and unlawfully detained persons, including women and children, would open new avenues of trust. So would the exchange of information on missing persons. These processes could provide a sound framework for an incremental approach to concession making. To be sustainable, peace in Syria must deliver tangible benefits for all communities. It must provide a democratic, dignified and peaceful framework for managing Syria's multicultural and multi-religious diversity. Ladies and gentlemen, human rights should never ever be seen as an obstacle to a successful negotiation. The opposite is true. Human rights are a key enabler of a successful negotiation and they are a safeguard for sustainable peace. The Syrian government has not only failed to protect civilians, it has often deliberately targeted them. So have some opposition forces, especially ISIL. Syrians will need to come to terms with the bitter legacy of this conflict. The Secretary General and the High Commissioner have repeatedly called for accountability. They have underscored the need for the Security Council to refer the situation in Syria to the International Criminal Court. Accountability is only one part of a broader approach to dealing with the past. It should also encompass elements of truth-seeking, reparations, institutional reform, criminal justice, and eventually reconciliation. Mr. President, let me conclude. I have tried to go to Syria, but have never been let in, nor have my human rights office colleagues. Although we have been unable to meet with Syrians in the country, we have talked to many in refugee camps in neighboring countries, but also all over the world. Their message is clear. They want peace, rule of law, and human rights. We can rebuild Syria, they said. Just let us do it. Their leaders should listen to the Syrian people, and so should we. I thank Mr. Joris for his part of the statement. We are in some very heavy uh, time restraints. I know there is a meeting starting in the Security Council. That's why I've opened the floor for the three members of the Security Council that asked for the floor first representative of the Russian Federation. Перевод есть? Господин Петрович, мы, мы признательны вам за вашу инициативу, потому что, конечно, сирийский конфликт, как и многие другие конфликтные ситуации на Ближнем Востоке, разумеется, это Ливия, это Ирак, это Йемен, конечно, Афганистан. Они затрагивают чувства всех государств-членов и все страны нашего, нашего беспокойного мира. И мы, конечно, признательны за брифинг господину Мистури. Стивен, тебе лично за большую работу на гуманитарном направлении. И господину Шимановичу. Но в целом я должен вам сказать, что сегодняшнее начало, начало дискуссии, оно протекает несколько странно. Дискуссия идет таким образом, как будто в Сирии нет террористической угрозы, а на полях сражения сирийская армия 
противостоит неизвестно кому. Но вы же ионовцы, многоопытные ионовцы. Почему прямо не говорится, что сирийская армия, солдаты, офицеры, генералы, в чем они виноваты? Почему прямо не говорится, что эти солдаты, сержанты, офицеры, генералы противостоят террористическим организациям, исламскому государству, Нусри, аль-каидовцам и тем, кто как волки в овечьей шкуре, волки в овечьей шкуре заявляют одно, а делают другое. Кто им оказывает поддержку? Это современная Сирия. Все говорим о необходимости сохранить государственные институты, чтобы не повторить печальный опыт Ирака. В последнее время здесь, в ООН и во многих столицах раздается вопрос, что должна сделать Россия. Давайте вспомним Известное высказывание одного известного президента. Не что должна сделать Россия, а что все мы должны сделать для того, чтобы помочь Сирии. Сирии помочь, выйти на политическое урегулирование. Что многие из нас всех должны сделать, чтобы помочь усилиям России и США обеспечить действительное прекращение огня, действительное сплочение усилий для борьбы с терроризмом. Терроризм имеет конкретные имена. Это исламское государство, Нусра, те, кто врет, что является умеренными. А на самом деле убивает граждан так же, как убивают террористические организации. А их просто в списки не внесли, потому что за их спинами влиятельные спонсоры. Вещи нужно называть своими именами. Иначе ничего не решить. В Российской Федерации и Соединенными Штатами очень многое сделано для продвижения процесса политического урегулирования. Правильно сказали брифферы и, и Стефан, и Стивен о том, что создана уникальная инфраструктура. Международная группа поддержки Сирии работают важнейшие целевые механизмы по прекращению огня, по гуманитарным вопросам. Работают другие важные двусторонние форматы. Тем, кто занимается кризисами, вообще занимается кризисом, мечтать можно о том, что сделано на сирийском направлении, какие уникальные по своей природе механизмы сформированы. Для других бы кризисов такие бы вещи были сделаны. Поэтому нужно этому помогать, а не разрушать. Важнейший вопрос – обеспечение режима прекращения огня. Прошу всех, кто имеет влияние в этом зале на группировки, обеспечить соблюдение этими группировками режима прекращения боевых действий. Мы находимся в Сирии, знаем, что там происходит. Там действуют военно-космические силы России. Там гибнут российские военнослужащие. Огромный вклад мы вносим в нормализацию гуманитарной обстановки. Спасибо, Стивен, что ты не забыл про это сказать в этом зале. Поэтому призываю всех в этом зале, нужно повернуть вопрос, что Россия должна сделать, что вы все и мы все должны сделать. Сплотить усилия для борьбы с террористическими организациями, не с абстрактными, а с конкретными именами. Нужно отказаться от своих узких планов.
Мы к такому сотрудничеству готовы. Ждем от остальных то же самое. Еще хотел бы сказать одну вещь. Это для, Стефан, тебе. Никто никакой приоритизации, приоритизации в сирийском урегулировании не обозначал. Нет приоритизации. Нет первая гуманитарная обстановка, вторая прекращение огня, третий политический процесс. Ты же именно так построил выступление. Нужно вести работу по всем направлениям. Нет другого выхода. Нужно возвращаться к переговорному столу. Вы говорите о сроках. Сроки – это результат переговоров. Не может быть иначе. Спасибо, господин Люкитов, что вы созвали сегодняшнюю дискуссию. Это очень важный разговор. Переговоры должны вестись. И надо действовать решительно. Сейчас не время. Сейчас. А когда время? I... О каком завершении, я еще не завершил, о каком завершении конфликта можно вести речь, когда через турецкую границу идут боевики, пополняются отряды. Мы с американцами делаем режим тишины, а в этот режим тишины заполняется этими боевиками и отрядами. О каком урегулировании весь, речь можно вести в такой ситуации? Настало время для конкретного разговора. Конечно, много эмоций вокруг сирийского кризиса, это понятно, но тем не менее... Хорошо, что прошло сегодняшнее заседание, и Российская Федерация предлагает и призывает всех расстаться с двойными стандартами и начинать откровенно, честно сотрудничать по обеспечению политического урегулирования в Сирии, по борьбе с терроризмом. А как же? Практически год назад Владимир Путин призвал с трибуны, давайте работать вместе, в одиночку ничего не получится. Каждый день слова эти подтверждаются. Спасибо большое. Извините, что взял очень больш... долгое время. Thank you to the distinguished representative of the Russian Federation. I kindly request representatives to be as brief as possible and to limit their interventions to three minutes. We have to finish the session in less than half an hour. I now give the floor to the representative of the United States. Thank you, Mr. President, and thank you to all three of our panelists for this very timely briefing to the GA. We appreciate the opportunity to discuss the imperative of ending the conflict and ending the suffering of the Syrian people. We agree with the panelists that doing so involves the pursuit of three key and interrelated goals, political transition negotiations, an enduring nationwide cessation of hostilities, and sustained unimpeded humanitarian access to all parts of Syria, to all Syrians in need, as determined by the UN. In this connection, we strongly support Special Envoy Demistura's efforts to facilitate constructive intra-Syrian talks. In our view, what Resolution 2254 stated remains absolutely true. The only sustainable solution to the current crisis in Syria is through an inclusive and Syrian-led political process, and a transition that meets the legitimate aspirations of the Syrian people. We want talks to take place in a constructive atmosphere and have encouraged the opposition to engage robustly in the current technical talks with the UN. The Syrian government must respond to the special envoy's questions and requests for detailed and constructive thoughts on a political transition. Against this backdrop, the cessation of hostilities has saved numerous lives, but remains under great strain and is at risk. Violence continues, largely at the hands of the government and its allies, but also due to Nusra attacks. On May 17th, members of the International Syria Support Group, ISSG, committed to intensify efforts to get the parties to stop further indiscriminate use of force. We have been engaged intensively with Russia in this regard. We remain concerned that the regime regularly focuses its attacks on moderate opposition groups fighting ISIL, Daesh, and that its actions have contributed to the group's growth in Syria. 
even as we intensify and expand coalition efforts to root out ISIL. As an ISSG co-chair, we ask that Russia also press the Syrian government to stop its offensive attacks and to stop its inhumane and strategically damaging strikes on civilians. Meanwhile, we will do all we can to press any groups we may have influence over. Which leads me to the humanitarian situation. We welcome recent aid deliveries in Afrin, Awar, and Kafrabatna, Daraya, Duma, and Muadamiya, and other besieged and hard to reach areas. However, we are alarmed by what, hap what appears to be a new regime tactic of allowing aid into besieged areas only to pummel them with helicopter drop bombs and airstrikes, as has been the case in Daraya and Duma and other locations. These attacks must stop. There is little Nusra presence and certainly no Nusra controlled territory in these particular areas. The Syrian government told the UN it has approved the remainder of June humanitarian aid deliveries. It must deliver on its commitments and we note that only the UN and its humanitarian partners should determine what is needed, how much is needed, and where it is needed. The UN has just submitted its access request for the month of July. We expect the regime to approve those requests in the entirety and then to facilitate the deliveries. We look to Russia to help make that happen. While we recognize that airdrops are neither a sustainable nor an adequate solution, the international community must remain vigilant to prepare for WFP airdrops to besieged areas if ground access is insufficient or in cases where areas receiving aid are bombed by the regime. In addition to the important issue of humanitarian access, we also remain deeply concerned about detainees and prisoners, including those in Hama Central Prison. We urge Russia to press the regime to comply with UN Security Council resolutions demands that all parties end practices resulting in extrajudicial killings and executions, torture, enforced disappearance, and other violations of international law. On May 17th, the ISSG unanimously requested the Special Envoy to facilitate agreements between the Syrian parties for the release of detainees and called upon any party holding detainees to protect the health and safety of those in custody. To conclude, the United States remains committed to Resolution 2254's vision for a six-month timeline for the Syrian parties to agree upon transitional governance as we try to get the cessation of hostilities back on track and bring about full, unimpeded humanitarian access. We are focused on the transition process, the truly essential component to ending the war. Thank you again to all three panelists and their teams for their continuing hard work to address these challenges. Thank you, Mr. President. I thank the distinguished representative of the United States. I now give the floor to the distinguished representative of the United Kingdom. The mic to the United Kingdom, please. Thank you very much, Mr. President, and for your patience. Um, I will keep this short and simple. We all have a role to play. Um, a Security Council resolution cannot end this war. Uh, that is why the meeting that we're having today is such an important one. And we should be under no illusions. It is a stain on the reputation of the United Nations and its members that the bloodshed continues in Syria to this day. We've seen a number of false dawns over the last five years, and today is no different. As Stefan de Mistura has just told us, what we have today may change tomorrow. Yes, it is true that the regime has agreed to road access to all 17 besieged areas requested by the UN. The International Syria Support Group has got us to this point, but we know that Assad's words count for very little. People are still going hungry, still going without medicine, and coming under sustained attack. Since the start of June, there has been some progress on access to besieged area, but let's be honest, this is too little and too late. Most of the 17 identified besieged areas remain cut off. Not only does this fall short of the access called for, but access to the locations which has been allowed is being disputed, disrupted, stripped of essential medical items, as Stephen O'Brien has just set out so starkly. Worst yet, the delivery of aid to Daraya and Duma both were met by brutal attacks, including with barrel bombs. There is little left in the regime that can shock, 
but punishing areas after humanitarian access is agreed, after life-saving supplies are delivered, is beyond inhuman. It is calculating, it is cruel, it is sick, it is sadistic. Mr. President, we need to remain resolute in the face of such cruelty. There is a path forward, and I'll make three brief points. First, the regime's promises must translate into real action on the ground. Far more convoys must get through and reach all areas in the June plan within the next two weeks. Second, we need to be clear that we will not sit idly by until land access is delivered. We must continue to plan for air delivery by the World Food Programme as agreed by the ISSG foreign ministers in Vienna last month. That's not ideal, but it's, it's what we need to do if ground access is not being granted. And finally, thirdly, as I said at the beginning, no illusions. The steps I've measured are a band-aid. Until the sieges are lifted and the bombs stop falling, we can't rest in our efforts to find a longer-term solution to the violence. The only way to achieve that is a political settlement, one that will return Syria to stability and peace. That will require an inclusive government and one that we can work with to tackle Daesh and other extremists. Only when that happens will stability return to the region, will the flow of people fleeing stop and the suffering of the people of Syria end. Thank you. I thank the distinguished representative of the United Kingdom and I still uh, kindly request representatives to be as brief as possible at maximum three minutes. I now give the floor to the distinguished representative of the Syrian Arab Republic. شكرا واسمح لي بصفتي الدولة المعنية بهذه الجلسة أن أخذ بعضا من وقتكم لكي أشرح للسادة الحاضرين الموقف الرسمي لبلادي مما يجري فيها ولذلك أستميحك عزرا سيد الرئيس بأنني لن أتمكن من الحديث فقط لمدة ثلاث دقائق بل على الأقل لمدة توازي من سبقني بالحديث وخاصة ممثلي الأمانة العامة يقول المثل الشعبي سيد الرئيس إذا عرف السبب بطل العجب وجل ما أصب إليه الآن في كلمتي هو أن أبين لكم سبب ما يحدث في سوريا من أزمة إنسانية خانقة ومؤلمة ومن أزمة سياسية لا تخفى على أحد من الحاضرين سيد الرئيس من جديد أجد نفسي في اجتماع جديد آخر عن الأزمة في بلادي سوريا اجتماعات باتت أسبوعية وفي بعض الأحيان شبه يومية اجتماعات في مجلس الأمن وأخرى في الجمعية العامة أحداث جانبية هنا وجلسات غير رسمية هناك وإحاطات طارئة في مكان آخر اجتماعات بداع وأخرى بدون داع لمجرد الاستعراض من جانب بعض الدول وتسجيل نقاط إعلامية اجتماعات متكررة لا طائلة تحتها في كثير من الأحيان لدرجة تدفعك إلى الاستنتاج بأن الهدف أضحى مجرد عقد الاجتماعات فقط وليس ما يمكن أن ينتج عنها أو كيفية مساعدة الشعب السوري للخروج من أزمته بطريقة موضوعية تحترم عقول الدبلوماسيين والناس وتنسجم مع أحكام القانون الدولي والقرار 46 على 182 الخاص بتقديم المساعدات الإنسانية في أوقات الطوارئ ربما يعتقد البعض واهما بأننا ضد عقد مثل هذه الاجتماعات في الأمم المتحدة وخارجها والجواب هو لا فنحن مع التركيز 
على الوضع في بلاد سوريا لأننا نحن من يعاني وليس أي أحد آخر ولكننا نريد أن يكون الهدف من هذه الاجتماعات هو فعلا المساعدة على حل الأزمة في سوريا بطريقة صادقة وناجعة بعيدا عن أي تسييس أضحى فاضحا وليس مجرد استخدام تلك الاجتماعات من جانب حكومات دول مسؤولة عن سفك دماء السوريين واستباحة البلاد بالأرهاب العابر للقارات والعابر للقوانين والعابر للحدود والعابر لميثاق الأمم المتحدة كوسيلة لشيطنة الحكومة السورية وتحويل الوضع الإنساني المسبق الصنع إلى استعراض دعائي مسرحي من قبل بعض تلك الحكومات لممارسة الضغط السياسي على حكومة بلادي سيد الرئيس إنما يزيد إنما يزيد الوضع ضغثا على إبالة كما يقال هو أن يتم عقد تلك الاجتماعات بناء على طلب دول منخرطة كليا في دعم الإرهاب في سوريا دول بات واضحا لكل ذي بصيرة بأنها كانت سببا رئيسيا في الأزمة في معاناة السوريين تأملوا معي أيها السادة هذا المشهد السوريالي إن السعودية التي دفعت إلى عقد هذا الاجتماع للاستماع إلى إحاطات حول الوضع الإنساني والسياسي ووضع حقوق الإنسان في سوريا هي نفس السعودية التي هددت الأمين العام للأمم المتحدة واستخدمت المال لابتزازه بغية سحب اسمها من القائمة المرفقة بتقرير الأمين العام حول الأطفال والنزاعات المسلحة وهي نفس السعودية التي تستخدم الإرهاب كوسيلة لتحقيق أجنداتها السياسية والتي تمول وتسلح الإرهابيين في سوريا والعراق دون مواربة هي نفس السعودية التي بات الجميع يدرك حقيقة بأنها مصدر وجذر الفكر المتطرف الوهابي الأرهابي الذي ينتشر كالسرطان في مختلف أنحاء العالم فحمل لنا ظواهر مقززة مثل داعش والقاعدة وجبهة النصر النصرة وبوكو حرام والشباب والجماعة الإسلامية وغيرها وهي نفس السعودية التي تملك أسوأ سجل في مجال حقوق الإنسان نفس السعودية التي تقصف اليمن منذ أكثر من سنة وتقتل المدنيين وتحاصر شعبا كاملا دون أن يحرك ما يسمى المجتمع الدولي ساكنا وبطبيعة الحال سيد الرئيس فإنه عندما يتم انتخاب السعودية لعضوية مجلس حقوق الإنسان الذي يعتز به السيد سيمونو سيمونوفيتش ورئاسة مركز الأمم المتحدة لمكافحة الأرهاب وعندما يتم أعطاء منتدى تحالف الحضارات لقطر وتمنح تركيا استضافة القمة الإنسانية الأولى وعندما يتم انتخاب إسرائيل رئيسا للجنة القانونية في الأمم المتحدة فهذا يعني أن هذه المنظمة الدولية قد أخذت تعمل ضد نفسها وضد ميثاقها سيد الرئيس إننا كحكومة في الجمهورية العربية السورية لا ننكر بأن هناك أزمة إنسانية في البلاد وأن هناك نازحين ومهجرين ومتضررين ولكننا نستهجن الطريقة الخاطئة للتعامل مع هذه الأزمة منذ بدايتها وحتى الآن ونستغرب النظر إليها بطريقة سطحية بمعزل عن خلفيات التدخل السياسي والعسكري والاقتصادي الخارجي في المشهد السوري ودون معالجة أساس الأزمة الإنسانية ألا وهو نشاطات المجموعات الإرهابية المسلحة المدعومة خارجيا أو دون التعامل بشكل جدي مع الأثر السلبي الذي تخلفه الإجراءات القسرية أحادية الجانب التي فرضتها دول الاتحاد الأوروبي والولايات المتحدة وغيرها على الشعب السوري لقد أمسى واضحا سيد الرئيس أن تحسين الوضع الإنساني في سوريا بشكل ملموس وحقيقي ومستدام يستتبع تخلي الحكومات عن هذا النهج الخاطئ 
الذي ثبت فشله المرة تلو الأخرى وعلى مدى ما يقارب الخمس سنوات فالأزمة الإنسانية لا تنتهي بمجرد الإعلان عن جمع بعض المساهمات المالية في مؤتمرات استعراضية أو الإعلان عن تقديم بعض المساعدات المالية الوهمية هنا أو هناك ويعرف السيد أوبراين أن 19 فقط في المئة من الوعود التي قدمت في مؤتمر لندن تم دفعها حتى الآن 19% فقط بعد مرور ما يزيد العام على تلك الوعود من يريد إنهاء الأزمة الإنسانية في بلاد سوريا لا يعقد قمة إنسانية في اسطنبول تحت رعاية نظام أردوغان الذي منع وفدنا من المشاركة في أعمال هذه القمة نفس النظام الذي يستخدم المعابر الإنسانية على الحدود لتزويد الأرهابيين في سوريا بالسلاح والعتاد ومن يريد إنهاء الأزمة في سوريا لا يتغاضى عن دعم إسرائيل للمجموعات الإرهابية بما في ذلك جبهة النصرة في منطقة الفصل في الجولان السوري المحتل وقيامها بعلاج مصابيهم في المشافي الإسرائيلية على نفقة النظام القطري سيد الرئيس إن حكومة بلادي هي الأحرص على تقديم كافة أنواع المساعدات الإنسانية لكل السوريين المتضررين من الأزمة أينما تواجدوا على كامل الأراضي السورية وهذا واجب عليها وهي ملتزمة به ولذلك فقد حرصت الحكومة السورية على التعاون والتنسيق مع الأمم المتحدة وغيرها من المنظمات الدولية السبعة عشر العاملة في سوريا للقيام بذلك وبعيدا عن البروباغندا التي يحاول البعض تسويقها بأن الحكومة السورية تعيق وصول المساعدات الإنسانية تثبت الوقائع على الأرض من جديد عكس ذلك تماما حيث وافقت الحكومة مؤخرا على 16 طلبا من أصل 17 طلبا قدمتها الأمم المتحدة لإدخال قوافل مساعدات إنسانية مشتركة إلى المناطق الساخنة في إطار خطة شهر حزيران يونيو فقط والحكومة السورية ملتزمة بالاستمرار في هذا النهج المتعاون مع الأمم المتحدة طالما أنه يتفق والمبادئ التوجيهية للأمم المتحدة الخاصة بإيصال المساعدات الإنسانية وفقا لقرار الجمعية العامة رقم 46 على 182 وطالما أنه يضمن سلامة وأمن العاملين الإنسانيين ووصول المساعدات إلى مستحقيها فعلا وليس إلى الإرهابيين والمرتزقة ختاما سيد الرئيس إلى جانب التزام الحكومة السورية بمكافحة الإرهاب كشرط أساسي لتحسين الوضع الإنساني بشكل مستدام في البلاد فإنها ما زالت ملتزمة بدفع المسار السياسي قدما حيث شارك وفد الجمهورية العربية السورية في محادثات جنيف وأبدى جدية والتزاما بهذه المحادثات شهد عليها السيد ديمستورا نفسه إلا أن المشكلة كانت بفرض بعض الدول لما يسمى وفد الرياض كمحاور وحيد وقدوم هذا الوفد إلى جنيف بشروط مسبقة وبهدف وحيد هو إفشال المحادثات وهو الأمر الذي بدأ واضحا في انسحاب هذا الوفد من المحادثات أكثر من مرة بتعليمات مباشرة من المشغلين الخارجيين له سيد الرئيس إن الحكومة السورية تحارب الإرهاب التكفيري الوهابي نيابة عن كل دول العالم ويقف معنا أصدقاء وحلفاء ممن يدركون هذه الحقيقة وإذا سمحتم للإرهاب أن يفرض صوته في سوريا فإن الإرهابيين سيصلون إلى عواصمكم وبلادكم كلها أعطونا اسم حكومة واحدة فقط من حكومات الدول الأعضاء تعتبر أن محاربة الإرهاب فوق أراضيها هي مسألة إنسانية بحتة دولة واحدة فقط أعطونا اسمها تعتبر أن محاربة الإرهاب فوق أراضيها هي مسألة إنسانية بحتة شكرا سيد الرئيس I thank the distinguished representative of the Syrian Arab Republic 
I now give the floor to the represent distinguished representative of the European Union. We need a mic for the European Union. Thank you, Mr. President. I have the honor to speak on behalf of the European Union. The candidate countries, the former Yugoslav Republic of Macedonia, Montenegro, Serbia and Albania, as well as Ukraine and Georgia, align themselves with this statement. Mr. President, the, the intra-Syrian political process has come to a critical point. Europe is contributing to the efforts of the international community. We reactivated our humanitarian office in Damascus. We are engaged on the ground as the first donor to the Syrian people and their host communities. And we play our role in encouraging and accompanying the political track. The European Union is committed to strengthening its collective work to step up support to the Syrian opposition, and in particular, the High Negotiation Committee as the opposition delegation to in the UN broker talks in Geneva. Therefore, the EU hosted an internal meeting of the two biggest components of the HINC, the National Coalition for Syria Revolution and Opposition Forces, SOC, and the National Coordination Body, NCB, in Brussels on 13th and 14th of June 2016. The EU is an active member of the International Syria Support Group, which launched a process endorsed unanimously by the Security Council. We will do all in our power to ensure the full implementation of Security Council Resolutions 2254, 2268 and the Geneva Communique. A Syrian-led and Syrian-owned political transition based on the principles of the Geneva Communique is needed to bring a lasting peace to the country, defeat Daesh in Syria and enable Syrians to return to their homes in safe conditions and to contribute to the reconstruction of the country. The EU calls on all parties to actively support a process that will lead to a credible and inclusive transition. Consequently, the EU urges the government delegation to finally lay out Syria's plan for implementing credible, inclusive transitional governance as called for by the Security Council Resolution 2254. Serious negotiations are required to reach an agreement by 1st of August on such a transition. Speeches such as that by Bashar al-Assad on 7th June, which reject the political process, reject the legitimacy of the opposition delegation, and advocate a military solution, seem calculated to undermine the, uh, secure the process in the International Support Group for Syria, and with it, the best hope for peace in Syria. There cannot be a lasting peace in Syria under the present leadership and until the legitimate, legitimate grievances and aspirations of all components of the Syrian society are addressed. Revitalizing and strengthening the cessation of hostilities is also essential. The EU condemns all attacks against civilians and civilian infrastructure, in particular against medical facilities, schools, markets, and IDP camps. The EU strongly condemns these indiscriminate attacks committed by the Syrian regime against its own people. The UN Special Envoy Staffan de Mistura has our full support. All international actors with influence on the parties, and notably with the Syrian regime, need to do whatever they can to make the cessation of hostilities work, secure the protection of civilian and the immediate, unimpeded and sustained humanitarian access, as well as make progress on the issue of arbitrarily detained persons, in order to have an enabling environment in which direct negotiations can start. Mr. President, the European Union is ready to step up its preparations for early engagement in the recovery and the rehabilitation effort in Syria to rapidly provide support to stabilization, reconstruction, and the return of refugees and IDPs to their homes in safe conditions once a political transition has started. Let me conclude by reiterating the EU's strong support for transitional justice and accountability for all serious human rights abuses and violations of international humanitarian law and renewing our call to the Security Council to refer the situation in Syria to the International Criminal Court. Thank you, Mr. President. I thank the distinguished representative of the European Union and now give the floor to His Excellency Vicentro 
Amendola, the Deputy Foreign Minister of Italy. I wish, first of all, to thank the briefers for their complete and comprehensive presentation, sharing also with us feelings of sufferance that they, they feel and they see in their daily work. It's not a question just of feeling, it's a political reality because we are speaking about hundreds of thousands of people dying, refugees, people dying in the Mediterranean Sea. This is not a diplomatic game. This is the effect of a reality that we are confronting ourselves. And the role of the UN, dear president, is under question because its reputation is not based just on the one point of the, the, the table legs that uh, the Mistura was referring us, but on the way out from this humanitarian crisis. This is the biggest humanitarian crisis of our our age, and we know that in front of this reality is not a question of diplomacy, it's a question of taking solution, it's a question of for the UN to bring a concrete humanitarian political so solution. There is no military way out from the conflict. This is a principle that leads us in speaking about uh, a refugee, uh, the solution of the, of the people that are living this condition. There is no question of military way out from this conflict. And also for the country like us, based on the UN principle to fight against terrorism, knows that closing this civil conflict will be and will give us more tools to defeat terrorist organization. There is no precondition in our challenge. I want to stress, aligning ourselves with the US statements, that our humanitarian situation and the humanitarian situation is priority for the UN to fulfill. And to the USG O'Brien, I would like to confirm all the responsibility that all of us took and Italy took at the donors conference in London and also for the question of the funding in our struggle for a peaceful solution. But if we look at the current junction with the cessation of hostilities, the second point, the humanitarian solution, and the third point, the way out with the resumption of the consultation in Geneva, of course we are speaking about the UN and its reputation because the way out from this conflict give us also the way to have a stable regional balance and also to avoid a conflict that creates insecurity on the global level like we are experiencing from the last five years, regional instability and security, global insecurity are, match are matching in a conflict that first of all are creating the greatest and the tragic uh, humanitarian condition. I would like to be clear and also supporting the, the special envoy de Mistura. We need of course to rebuild mut mutual trust probably is the fourth leg of the table that he was describing, because it's the only way for our consultation and also for respecting the work of the ICG and with the two chairs to, to create condition to advance, not just in uh, the cessation of hostility that are referring to us a new reality, but also for a credible, inclusive, and non-sectarian transitional governments. We agree, and also we acknowledge, as he said, that all the parts agreed on transition. And so transition means also mutual respect to provide and proceed in a political solution that is our is also under our responsibility to push and to boost and to support in the way that there are one target that is the end of the civil war, is the end of this humanitarian crisis with all our support also in resources and also together with this defeating terrorist organization that are spreading in the Middle East. It's not just a question to put priority. Our priority is to to give an end to the fifth year of conflict that created the greatest and the most tragic, brutal uh, conflict in our area for the regional balance and for the global balance. So let me conclude, dear president, thanking for this discussion. Of course, we are in a, an extremely delicate situation. Our time schedule is based on this mutual trust that has to bring us to a, a credible, inclusive, uh, uh, transitional proposal that has to resume on the base of resolution 2254 and the Geneva communique. But this political transition also give us to the UN the possibility, first of all, to address the humanitarian crisis, the humanitarian situation that is not 
a diplomatic gay, but is the effect of the reality that we are living. And second point, to give to the end the possibility in this Middle East, in this global framework, to create condition for political resolution of conflict. The time is passing, our rapporteurs and briefers are telling us their job and their uh, passion to find a way out from this conflict, but the reality is the number that they show us. is not a question of just diplomatic confrontation, but the reality of murder, people dying, people fleeing from the country and dying in the Mediterranean Sea. We have a very heavy problem of time constraint here because um, Mr. Stefan de Mistura will not be able to follow us after 12 o'clock. I have to give back to him uh, the possibility to comment. So I, I will bring in now some of the uh, nations from the region, but I hope it can be done within the three minutes because that's the only possibility to give Mr. Mistura a possibility to answer. Uh, I first give the floor to the representative, uh, distinguished representative of Saudi Arabia. Shukran, Sayyid al-Rais. I would like to thank you for the opportunity to ask you to ask for a meeting with the Human Rights Commission to discuss the human rights in Syria. And I thank the government and the Human Rights Commission for the Human Rights Commission and the Human Rights Commission for the Human Rights Commission. على ما قدموه من إحاطات قيمة سيد الرئيس لقد قام وفد بلادي بالمشاركة مع وفود ثمانية دول بمخاطبتكم بالنيابة عن 59 دولة للتعبير عن بالغ القلق جراء الاستمرار في انتهاك وقف الأعمال العدائية واستمرار الحصار المفروض من قبل السلطات السورية على ما يقارب, من ما يقارب 80% من المدن السورية وعرقلة إيصال المساعدات الإنسانية بما في ذلك المواد الطبية بما يرقى إلى أن يشكل جرائم حرب فضلاً عن, الاستخدام عن الاستمرار في استخدام البراميل المتفجرة والقصف الجماعي العشوائي وسائر أنواع القتل والتشريد والتجويع إن من المؤلم أن نكون في شهر رمضان المبارك الذي يحتفل به فيه المسلمون بالصوم للتعبير عن تعاطفهم مع الجائعين أن تتخذ السلطات السورية من هذا الشهر وقتا لدفع عمليات التجويع إلى أقصى حد واستخدامها سلاحا في المواجهة وإننا نطالب مجددا برفع الحصار وإيصال المساعدات الإنسانية بصفة فورية ومستدامة إلى جميع المناطق السورية دون استثناء وحسب الحاجة وفقاً للقانون الإنسان الدولي وقرارات مجلس الأمن ذات الصلة بما في ذلك القرار 2254 الصادر عن مجلس الأمن سيد الرئيس لقد انخرطت حكومة بلادي في العمل بإيجابية من خلال مجموعة الدعم الدولية لسوريا التي صدر عنها بيان في السابع عشر من شهر مايو الماضي يدعو إلى ضرورة إيصال المساعدات الإنسانية لجميع أنحاء المناطق السورية وبالرغم من إعلان اللجوء إلى الإنزال الجوي للمساعدات الإنسانية في حال استمرت عرقلة إيصال المساعدات بحلول الأول من شهر يونيو الحالي إلا أننا وبعد مرور المدة الزمنية المحددة لازلنا نشهد عدم التعامل بجدية مع ما ورد عن مجموعة الدعم الدولية في سوريا ونرى أن السلطات السورية تكتفي بالسماح بإدخال بعض المساعدات الإنسانية التي لا تتناسب بأي شكل من الأشكال مع مدى حاجة المدن المحاصرة ولا يمكن إلا أن تعتبر ذرة للرماد في العيون في محاولة مستمرة للالتفاف على إرادة المجتمع الدولي وتجاهل الالتزام بقرارات مجلس الأمن ذات الصلة سيد الرئيس إننا نناشد مكتب الأمم المتحدة للشؤون الإنسانية أن يقوم بدوره الموكل إليه في تيسير إيصال المساعدات الإنسانية إلى مستحقيها بأفضل الطرق وبمنتهى الشفافية ويطالب وفد بلادي بمراجعة دقيقة لضمان إيصال المساعدات دون تمييز وفقا للحاجة والالتزام بالمعايير الإنسانية سيد الرئيس يؤكد وفد بلادي على أن الأزمة الإنسانية لا يمكن معالجتها بشكل جدي دون الوصول إلى حل سياسي 
ومن هذا المنطلق نجدد دعمنا للمبعوث الدولي في إطار ولايته الممنوحة له وفقا للقرار 2254 وفي إطار الولاية الممنوحة له من هذه الجمعية العامة التي كانت المصدر في تعيين المندوب الأممي ونناشده الالتزام بخارطة الطريق التي تم إرساؤها حول الانتقال السياسي بدءا بتشكيل هيئة حكم انتقالي ذات صلاحيات تنفيذية واسعة وفقا لبيان جنيف واحد والانخراط الإيجابي مع الهيئة العليا للمفاوضات وتهيئة الظروف المناسبة للعودة إلى المفاوضات الرسمية في أقرب وقت ممكن سيد الرئيس لقد عانى الشعب السوري طويلا من جميع أشكال العنف والحصار والتجويع ولقد آن الأوان لإنهاء هذه المعاناة وبشكل فوري وإننا نعتقد أن ذلك يتطلب خطوات شجاعة وتضافر الجهود بهدف التصدي لجميع المتسببين في تلك المعاناة والعمل على محاسبتهم ومنعهم من الإفلات من يد العدالة الدولية والإنسانية سيد الرئيس يعيد وفد بلادي تأكيده على الاستمرار في تقديم الدعم الكامل للشعب السوري واحترام قراراته ومساندته بجميع الوسائل الممكنة شكرا لكم سيد الرئيس Thank you to the distinguished representative of, of Saudi Arabia and I'll give the floor to the distinguished representative of the Islamic Republic of Iran Thank you Mr. President thanks for convening this meeting and thanks for the panelists for their uh, reports Mr. President, in a complex situation such as Syria, a successful and efficient humanitarian operation needs to be guided by the criteria such as those outlined in the General Assembly Resolution 46-A182, namely the principles of neutrality, impartiality, non-politicization of humanitarian work, and respect for national sovereignty and coordination with the national authorities. It is an established fact that a number of armed terrorist groups are currently in control of and active in parts of Syria and control large patches territory and arteries. <clears throat> they have been and continue to be a tremendous challenge for humanitarian operations in Syria. Their occupation of some densely populated regions have exacerbated the situation. They have spread terror and intimidation among the population who they have forcibly used as human shields. Such a control of territory and arteries by feckless and reckless groupings, no matter where it occurs, creates major threats and can kick off humanitarian crisis. This is exactly at the core of the problem we are facing in Syria. Terrorist groups, such as Daesh and Jebhat al-Nusra <coughs> and their affiliates and foreign fighters that they attract, have wreaked havoc in the country and constitute the major challenge that the international community needs to confront if it seeks to improve the humanitarian situation in Syria. <coughs> Experience shows that successes achieved in the delivery of humanitarian assistance to beneficiaries in both stable and unstable parts of Syria would not be possible without the assistance and facilities provided to the United Nations and international organizations by the Syrian authorities. We welcome the continued cooperation between the Syrian government and the United Nations in order to provide and deliver humanitarian aid to those affected by the crisis in all governorates of Syria and without distinction. We note that out of the 17 restive areas requested by the UN under June 2016 plan, the approval to reach 16 has already been granted by the government where the humanitarian activities can be carried out. At the same time, we voice our grave concern over the tragic humanitarian situation in Foa and Kafaria as a result of continuous siege by opposition fighters. We want to know how UN and other plans to break this siege and ensure humanitarian access in those areas. And finally, the crisis in Syria requires a comprehensive political settlement based on dialogue among Syrians without preconditions. This political approach should go hand in hand with counter-terrorism efforts. We emphasize an exclusively Syrian-led and Syrian-owned political transition in order to end hostilities and re-establish peace and tranquility. I thank you, Mr. President. I thank the distinguished representative of the Islamic Republic of Iran. I now give the floor to the distinguished representative of Turkey. 
Mr. President. Thank you for conveying today's meeting and the briefers for sharing their valuable insights. The ongoing grave situation in Syria, in particular the devastating humanitarian conditions, continue to unravel the very principles of the UN Charter. Despite numerous calls from the international community, the suffering of the Syrian people continues unabated. Since the start of the Syrian conflict, the Syrian regime has deliberately besieged cities and starved the civilians as a tactic of war. Its continuous threat against the UN work in Syria has been exemplified in a recent report. Blatant disrespect for international humanitarian law and international norms that the pillars of our humanity turn the carnage in Syria into a colossal stain in our collective human conscience. We reiterate the call made by 59 member states, including Turkey, in a joint letter which strongly condemned the denial of humanitarian access to those in need and the call on all parties, in particular the Syrian regime, to allow and to facilitate immediate, full, unimpeded and sustained access of humanitarian relief to all areas, including besieged communities, as well as parts to reach areas. We urge the Security Council to uphold its responsibilities by ensuring the implementation of all the measures in its very own resolutions. This should include taking appropriate measures to alleviate humanitarian sufferings and to ensure that humanitarian assistance is provided to those in need in Syria. Use of air operations to achieve that should remain on the table. Turkey continues to assume more than a fair share of the burden of the ongoing devastation. Members of this audience, including the President Likatov, yourself and the USG O'Brien are well aware of this fact. We are extremely concerned by the humanitarian and security impacts of the crisis, which constitute a major national security threat also to our country. Mr. President, we are at a critical turn in Syria. The crisis can be uh, only overcome by a political solution. However, the opposition represented by the High Negotiations Committee cannot be expected to negotiate under fire. The cessation of hostilities is systematically violated and degraded by the regime and its allies, including Russian Federation. Those who try to find excuses for their attacks on civilian targets, such as hospitals, mosques, markets, IDP camps, which amount to war crimes, are driving the international community. Without further ado, the regime, which despises the political process as seen by Assad's June 7th speech, should be pressured to talk about the political transition with concrete timelines, new constitution and elections. A transitional governing body with full executive powers should be established. After six years of brutality and crime, Syrian people cannot be expected to settle for anything different. Mr. President, we met today to discuss the sufferings of the Syrian people. The regime representative, instead of making a meaningful contribution to our debate, has chosen to misuse it for denigration. It is a new moral law grant for them. It is equally unfortunate, regrettable, and does not leave much room for optimism for the future of the Syrian people and the hands of the regime. I thank you. I thank the distinguished representative of Turkey. I now turn over to Mr. Staffan de Mistura uh, to reply to the discussion so far. Thank you, Mr. President, and uh, I wish to thank, frankly, all nine distinguished delegates who have uh, so far expressed their own opinion and uh, provided some useful comments. I do not have really any main point to add to what I already did, but what I can say is that I did listen with great attention and did take note of all the points raised. I'm planning myself, as you know, next week to come to the Security Council for a full briefing on the current situation on Syria. And I do recognize that uh, um, at the moment it is a critical period and therefore any good advice, suggestion, comment or uh, even support coming from everyone who is member of the UN on uh, an issue which is affecting the whole world indirectly or directly and it's certainly the biggest humanitarian crisis since the Second World War is helping my own thinking and hopefully also the political process that we want to promote. So I want to thank you, Mr. President, and uh, all those who intervened. Over to you. Thank you very much. Uh, 
to the special envoy of, of the Secretary General for, for Syria. I know that Mr. Simonovic is also uh, forced to leave very soon. Do you have some remarks to the debate so far? No, thank you very much. Let's try to give advantage to member states that are asking for the floor. Okay, then it will, uh, we have two, four, we have seven countries now asking for the floor, and uh, Mr. O'Brien will stay to try to answer. We have postponed the meeting now for uh, half an hour. We can do it for one half hour extra, and if we are not able to do it within that frame, time frame, not all countries will have the floor. I first give the floor to the distinguished representative of Qatar. Shukran, Sayyid al Rais. I would like to thank you for the opportunity to this meeting. كما نعبر عن الشكر للسادة أوبراين وسيمونوفيتش ودي مستورة على مشاركتهم لقد استعرضنا العديد من العناصر الهامة المتعلقة بالأزمة في سوريا في الرسالة التي وجهت إلى سعادتكم باسم 59 دولة عضو في الأمم المتحدة من بينها دولة قطر وتطرقت إلى الحالة الإنسانية في سوريا وأود في هذه المناسبة أن أدلي باختصار ببعض الملاحظات والأسئلة تواصل قوات النظام السوري هجماتها الإجرامية وارتكاب المجازر واستهداف المرافق الأساسية بما في ذلك المرافق الطبية في انتهاك صارخ لقرارات مجلس الأمن لا سيما القرار 2268 بشأن وقف الأعمال العدائية والقرار 2286 والقرار 2254 الذي طالبت الفقرة 13 منه بإيقاف الهجمات ضد المدنيين والأهداف المدنية وأي استخدام عشوائي للأسلحة أن الانتهاكات الخطيرة والفضائع الجماعية التي يتواصل ارتكابها في سوريا وترتكب الأغلبية الساحقة منها على أيدي النظام تقع على مرأة منا وتنقل إلينا عبر الإحاطات والتقارير المتواترة وبالتالي يترتب علينا كأسرة دولية واجبات أخلاقية وقانونية يترتب علينا أولا إدانة هذه الفضائع وحماية الشعب السوري الذي يتعرض للإبادة وهنا نسأل كيف يمكن للأمم المتحدة بعد سلسلة القرارات التي اتخذتها منذ عام 2011 أن تقوم بواجبها في إنفاذ هذه القرارات وحماية المدنيين ووقف المجازر فعليا ويترتب علينا ثانيا تعزيز الجهود لاستمرار تدفق المساعدات الإنسانية بصورة منتظمة ووصولها إلى محتاجيها في جميع مناطق سوريا وأن ندين بشدة استمرار حصار المدن وعرقلة وصول المساعدات الإنسانية إلى محتاجيها وهنا نود معرفة موقفكم من قصف المساعدات بعد إدخالها كما حصل مؤخرا في دارية ثالثا البدء بعملية سياسية جامعة بقيادة سورية تلبي التطلعات المشروعة للشعب السوري تهدف للتنفيذ الكامل لبيان جنيف وإنشاء هيئة حكم انتقالية تخول سلطات تنفيذية كاملة وهنا نود الاستفسار حول مواقف الأطراف السورية من تنفيذ بيان جنيف وتشكيل هيئة الحكم الانتقالي رابعا يترتب ضمان تحقيق العدالة والمساءلة عن جميع الجرائم المرتكبة في سوريا ومحاسبة مرتكبي الفضائع أيا كانوا وتحقيقا لهذه القاية سننظم اليوم بالتعاون مع عدد من الدول الأعضاء جلسة حوار حول تحقيق العدالة ونتساءل هنا بمناسبة الحديث عن العملية السياسية في جنيف التي تضمنت عناصر عديدة لكن قاب عنها عنصر المساءلة عن الفضائع فما تفسيركم لذلك ختاما السيد الرئيس إننا في دولة قطر بوصفنا عضوا في المجتمع الدولي نعي هذه المسؤولية القانونية والأخلاقية وندعم جميع الجهود الدولية الرامية لحل الأزمة بما يحقق تطلعات الشعب السوري وشكرا لكم. I thank the distinguished representative of Qatar and I give the floor to the distinguished representative of Algeria. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll be very brief. Thank you for your 
for your invitation and thanks, I thanks also the briefer. I would like just to remind you what uh, we haven't done that uh, very often, to remind that Algeria, while being far from geographically from Syria, is uh, sheltering tens of thousands of Syrians right now. The continuation of destruction of Syria could, could not be put under silence or accepted. It will take years to reconstruct and to rebuild the land and the south. The immense humanitarian and more than ever, a it's a more than ever a challenging duty, but it's also a moral and legal obligation. Equally, we think that bringing humanitarian aid is bringing also some kind of hope to the populations that they are not being forgotten. To that end, we think also that bringing humanitarian aids, aid to the Syrian people must be conducted without hindrance whatsoever and must respect the principle accepted and set forth notably by resolution, General Assembly Resolution 46182. It is especially important because whereas there is an absence of action and help, terrorism thrives, doing even more trials to the population and becoming thus a large part of the problem. We will never overemphasize how crucial is a political solution, the only and real and effective way to end the trials of the population and the humanitarian crisis. Let me put our views. It is up to the Syrian to decide between themselves and in a spirit of national dialogue and reconciliation to decide the future they want with the help and support of the international community. And we strongly encourage the international support group to deepen this track. No one can or should accept that the fate of the Syrians and of Syria continue to be the subject of proxy ambitions that led so far to more terrorism and emergence of non-state actors that are doing more trauma to an already severely scorched country. We call for the resumption of the Geneva meetings, meeting rounds, a framework to alleviate the suffering, to stop the spread of terrorism and to pave the way for the long awaited political solution that will respect the multitude of cultures, ethnicities and religions that Syria was known for for centuries. Thank you, sir. Thank the distinguished representative of Algeria. Now give the floor to the distinguished representative of Australia. Thank you, Mr. President. In view of the time, I will significantly shorten my remarks. Australia thanks the UN, the ISSG and its co-chairs for ongoing efforts to address the humanitarian crisis in Syria and their leadership on efforts to negotiate a political end to the conflict. But we are deeply concerned at the recent surge in violence. The Syrian government, its backers and all parties to the conflict must comply with the cessation of hostilities and halt attacks on civilian areas. It is now important to proceed with transforming the cessation into a comprehensive nationwide ceasefire as called for by the ISSG and UN. In this regard, it would be useful to know UN views, including those of Special Envoy de Mastura, on how this transformation to a full ceasefire might be taken forward and what the role of the UN might be. We stress that humanitarian access is not something to be provided conditionally. The Syrian government and armed groups must allow full, sustained and unimpeded humanitarian access as required by UN Security Council Resolution 2268. Civilians, humanitarian personnel, medical facilities, and civilian infrastructure must be respected and protected in accordance with international humanitarian law. Ultimately, the only way to resolve the crisis is through a negotiated political solution to end the conflict. Australia calls on the Syrian government and opposition groups to engage constructively in UN facilitated peace talks to this end. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank the distinguished representative of Australia. I now give the floor to the distinguished representative of Cuba. Muchas gracias, señor presidente. Eh, mi delegación eh, toma nota de las ponencias que se han realizado en esta mañana. Señor presidente, la amenaza del terrorismo en Siria es insoslayable. Lamentamos que no se haya puesto de relieve en las ponencias que se nos han presentado hoy y que en muchas de las intervenciones de las delegaciones se haya omitido las consecuencias de este flagelo. 
Mi delegación condena el terrorismo en todas sus formas y manifestaciones y por quien quiera y contra quien quiera se cometa. Los grupos terroristas y combatientes extranjeros son un desafío de la comunidad internacional y se debe enfrentar con esfuerzos colectivos y multilaterales. En materia de entrega de asistencia humanitaria, mi delegación acoge con satisfacción la cooperación que ha brindado el gobierno sirio hasta ahora en la entrega de ayuda humanitaria. Asimismo, quisiera reiterar que la entrega de ayuda humanitaria y de la asistencia humanitaria se debe realizar de conformidad con la resolución 46-182 de las Naciones Unidas. Señor Presidente, solo será posible lograr la paz en Siria mediante el respeto al derecho del pueblo sirio a decidir su propio destino. La solución política a través del diálogo y las negociaciones es la única alternativa para el conflicto en Siria. En este sentido, reconocemos los esfuerzos del enviado especial Mustafa de Mistura y del Grupo Internacional de Apoyo a Siria. Y al igual que otras delegaciones, reiteramos la necesidad de reanudar el diálogo y las conversaciones. Demandamos el cese de la injerencia interna en Siria, quienes alimentan ese conflicto desde el exterior con el declarado objetivo de un cambio de régimen, son los responsables de los miles de víctimas civiles acumuladas durante estos años. Reiteramos una vez más la preocupación que nos genera la pérdida de vidas inocentes como consecuencia del conflicto en Siria y condenamos todos los actos de violencia que tienen lugar en ese país contra la población civil. La supuesta protección de vidas humanas y el combate a elementos extremistas no pueden ser un pretexto para la intervención extranjera en ese país. Es por ello que demandamos el cese de la presencia foránea, el cese de la manipulación, el cese del doble rasero en esta situación. Muchas gracias. I thank the distinguished representative of Cuba. I now have three more speakers. And I end the list now with Venezuela, the Netherlands, and Jordan. And I urge you to be within the three minutes. Uh, first, I give the floor to the distinguished representative of the Bolivian Republic of Venezuela. Muchísimas gracias, señor presidente. En virtud del tiempo, voy a igualmente este, a reducir este, um, la declaración que vamos a dar hoy. Nuestro país ve con alta expectativa la posible convocatoria a las conversaciones de paz en Ginebra con todos los actores claves en el conflicto en Siria. En tal sentido, reiteramos una vez más que la única solución al conflicto es política, pacífica, negociada e incluyente. Manifestamos nuestro reconocimiento a los esfuerzos diplomáticos desplegados por el señor Estafan de Mistura para alcanzar una paz firme y duradera en ese país. Venezuela apoya las gestiones para lograr esa salida en esa nación árabe. Reiteramos que la inclusión de los kurdos en las conversaciones de paz es fundamental. Este sector de la sociedad siria debe estar representado en Ginebra. Igualmente, acogemos el comunicado conjunto de Rusia y de Estados Unidos sobre la extensión del cese de hostilidades. Creemos que mientras exista voluntad política de las partes, se pueden lograr mejores resultados en el ámbito humanitario. Esperamos que el cese al fuego se convierta en un alto al fuego permanente para que así la paz y la estabilidad se restablezca en ese país. En el ámbito humanitario, celebramos que dentro del plan de junio de la OCHA se haya podido avanzar en 16 de las 17 zonas catalogadas como asediadas y de difícil acceso. Si bien no estamos ante una situación ideal, Convoyes de ayuda humanitaria han ingresado a dicha zona, hecho este que reconocemos de forma positiva. Rechazamos las prácticas de asedio de cualquiera de las partes en conflicto contra la población civil, las cuales violan el derecho internacional de los derechos humanos y el derecho internacional eh, eh, humanitario, constituyendo un crimen de guerra. Eh, por otro lado, Venezuela considera que la amenaza terrorista representada por el ISI, el Frente al Nusra y sus asociados es el principal desafío en Siria. La lucha contra ese flagelo exige el concurso de la comunidad internacional para impedir el financiamiento de estas organizaciones, así como la transferencia ilegal de armas a tales grupos. Por último, la crisis en Siria requiere de una solución política basada en el diálogo entre los sirios bajo un liderazgo sirio y sin condiciones previas. Creemos además que la vía política va de la mano con la lucha contra el terrorismo. 
Las conversaciones de Ginebra están destinadas a promover una solución política y pacífica, por lo, por lo que el éxito de estas reuniones dependerá de la voluntad política y compromiso de las partes. Muchas gracias, señor presidente. I thank the distinguished representative of Venezuela. I now give the floor to the distinguished representative of the Netherlands. Thank you, Mr. President, and thank you to the uh, distinguished briefers of today. The Netherlands aligns itself with the statement made by the EU. As a member of the ISSG and therefore the two task forces on humanitarian access and the cessation of hostilities, I would like to focus on a few particular points that were discussed at a side event that we hosted yesterday with the title De-Escalation in Syria, Understanding Local Ceasefire Dynamics and Their Implications for a National Cessation of Hostilities. The conflict dynamics and peace-building opportunities presented by local ceasefires are important for purposes of complementing a national cessation of hostilities that we all are currently prioritizing. Ultimately, Syria needs a top-down and bottom-up strategy for peace and stabilization. Grasping the situation on the ground in terms of humanitarian and political challenges, as well as conflict transformation opportunities, is critical for the international community to help fashion feasible solutions. In the context of both the need for unimpeded humanitarian access and the need to maintain the national cessation of hostilities, we should not overlook economic motivations that go hand in hand with besieged areas, even when there is a local cessation of hostilities or as part of the national cessation of hostilities. While the majority of the population is suffering tremendously, there will always be people profiting from a siege, unfortunately. We furthermore need to understand better the role of local reconciliation committees, the conflicting roles of international involvement at the local level, and promote the role of civil society as neutral arbiters on the ground level to maintain the peace and communicate concerns across political divides. Last but not least, we would also like to draw the attention to the disturbing effect of forced population transfers that have taken place and that has deeply troubling implications for Syria's survival as a pluralistic, multi-ethnic nation. Thank you, Mr. President. I thank the distinguished representative of the Netherlands and now give the floor to the distinguished representative of Jordan. سيد الرئيس إن الأولوية التي يجب أن نعمل جميعا جاهدين لتحقيقها هي وقف إطلاق النار ووقف إراقة الدماء وإنهاء الأزمة الإنسانية المرتبطة بمدى التقدم في المسار السياسي والذي يتطلب إرادة سياسية جادة من قبل كافة الأطراف تتطلب الأزمة السورية وتطورات الأوضاع على الأرض تكثيف الجهود من قبل كافة الأطراف لدعم مساعي الأمم المتحدة وإنجاح المفاوضات بين الأطراف السورية للتوصل إلى حل سياسي وفقا لبيان جنيف وقرارات الأمم المتحدة خاصة القرار 2254 مؤكدين على ضرورة التنفيذ الكامل لهذه القرارات ويؤكد الأردن دعمه لجهود مبعوث الأمم المتحدة سيد ستيفان ديمستورا وجهود المجموعة الدولية, لد... الدولية لدعم سوريا والتي ينخرط الأردن بكل فاعلية فيها من أجل إحلال السلام في سوريا ونأمل بأن يتم استئناف المفاوضات في أقرب وقت وأن يتم التوصل إلى توافق بشأن المرحلة الانتقالية الأمر الذي سيمهد الطريق لعودة الأمن والاستقرار لسوريا وعودة اللاجئين السوريين وبالنسبة للأوضاع الإنسانية في سوريا وخصوصا في المناطق المحاصرة فإن الأردن يؤكد على ضرورة وصول هذه المساعدات إلى مستحقيها ومن دون أي عوائق أو شروط مسبقة وندعو جميع الأطراف إلى تغليب مصلحة الشعب السوري وتغليب القانون الإنساني الدولي فيما يتعلق بإصال هذه المساعدات أشكرك سيد الرئيس I thank the distinguished representative of Jordan and now give the floor to Under Secretary General Stephen O'Brien for a response. Well, thank you very much indeed, uh, Mr. President. And again, I repeat my thanks to you for having convened this meeting and giving an opportunity for uh, those of us uh, on a day to day basis engaged with seeking to alleviate the suffering of those who are caught up in this crisis in Syria uh, the chance to hear 
from the member states. And uh, I know that I speak on behalf of Special Envoy to Mistura, as well as uh, Ivan Simonovich for the human rights uh, side of the House, that uh, we do appreciate very much the engagement and advice that we have just received from you, the member states, uh, your perspectives, your, your genuine and deep concerns, and your resolve to try and find a way forward on what has been a very long and protracted uh, war crisis. Um, I have to say I am put in mind from so many of the comments of the conversation I had as I left the World Humanitarian Summit in Istanbul just recently. I went straight uh, to a point on the border with, uh, between Turkey and Syria. As it happens, I know that the President did exactly the same. Uh, we were in two different parts. Uh, I think it was an opportunity for us to express on behalf of all member states our deep commitment to wanting to reach the people in need and what we can do to resolve it. And I happened to meet in the hospital run by Syrian doctors who have been able to escape from Syria uh, and uh, were now in Rehanli in Turkey, just on the uh, Turkish side of the border, uh, just up uh, from the Baba Hawa crossing, uh, which I also took the opportunity to visit. And I met Dr. Mazin, who was lying in a bed, extremely weakened, deeply and terribly injured. He had been bombed in Al-Quds Hospital just a few days before in eastern Aleppo. As he himself was a doctor giving life-saving treatment to people in Syria, whoever they were, and from whichever quarter they came. And he himself had been bombed. He had a terrible brain injury, and his abdomen was obviously very, very clearly uh, very badly wounded. It took him half an hour, but eventually he summoned up enough energy just to say to me, please, peace. That's all he could say. So I think the discussion we've had today has very much put me in mind of that. And I don't wish to be either emotional or rhetorical about it, but I think that ultimately is the sense of moral as well as practical obligation that I think we all face in trying to find a way forward. So in uh, looking at the various points and questions that have been made, I won't stray into the political. I think those points have been extremely powerfully made by you, the member states, and they will be uh, noted and transmitted to the extent that uh, Special Envoy de Mistura had to leave uh, for uh, other engagements, but on the political track and how we can try to find what we all know to be the only way forward, which is to find a political solution uh, to this deep and terrible crisis of violence and humanitarian need. Uh, I, I also note that the human rights aspect uh, is covered by the fact that a number spoke to the issue of violations of the law, and I think it's fair to say that we are making every effort to make sure uh, that the evidence is being gathered at all times, and that however long it takes, hopefully only a short while, uh, but the effort to make sure there is no impunity will be made to gather the evidence and hold people who have perpetrated terrible things and violating the human rights and international humanitarian or indeed refugee law are brought to account uh, in the due process of justice in due course. Uh, so uh, if, if anybody's any doubt, that should in itself be, I hope, a deterrent to some of the absolutely abominable behaviors that we've seen in the five years of this protracted crisis to date. Uh, another point I would just like to uh, draw from the m member states' uh, 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 observations has been to salute the extraordinary bravery and courage of all those, particularly in the UN, in the field, uh, the humanitarian uh, coordinators in particular, both uh, national and uh, regional, and to make sure that we do salute those who are, are putting their lives on the line day in, day out, be they international or local, multilateral or specific uh, NGOs. Uh, it's it all... Um, in the service of those who need us most. And I thank you very much for your observations. Uh, the other general point that I think I ought to cover is that there is, under 46182, a very real need to make sure that whilst, of course, we recognize that if you have a cessation of hostilities, that gives much greater confidence to all those engaged in negotiations for access, a greater sense of confidence that if they do secure agreements, those can stick and that they're not going to be uh, put awry or at risk by uh, shelling or airstrikes or any other form of violence 
uh, which could get, uh, which may not necessarily be identifiable with the parties who have made the agreement. So there is, with a cessation of hostilities, a context of confidence, but without the conditionality. And I think it's very important that we recognise that as a matter of law, uh, the access has to remain absolutely in line with international humanitarian law and 46182 of independent, neutral and impartial, uh, safe, unimpeded access at all times to whoever needs us, wherever they are and however that need has arisen. Uh, I was um, particularly asked, I think, uh, by uh, a number um, about the airdrops and of course we have made it clear that uh, the UN will always use uh, all um, available logistical methods to bring assistance to people in need throughout Syria, whether that's by land, sea or air. I'm pleased that uh, uh, the World Food Programme has developed, uh, as you well know, concrete plans for airdrops and air bridges to various uh, locations. Uh, as the ISSG members are aware, uh, and indeed of what that is, what is needed to make this a reality, uh, the, the World Food Programme has made it very clear that the consent of the government of Syria and security guarantees from all parties have to be a precondition of those uh, airdrops taking place. And so whilst we continue to plan for those airdrops and air bridges, uh, uh, the land access uh, remains the priority and that is what we continue to demand. It is not only the safest, it is of course the best value for money in terms of being able to use the resources you give us uh, to make sure that we reach people in need and it's the most effective way of reaching people at scale and at the scale that they need and with a full range of supplies, particularly, I have to say, if medical supplies are not taken off the convoys. Uh, so approximately six weeks of daily helicopter rotations, just to give you a picture, uh, is the same. Six weeks of those rotations is the equivalent of food that is delivered by road from Damascus to Muadamir on the 1st of June in one convoy. So that's the scale of difference is why we put such emphasis on land access uh, but are ready uh, with uh, air, uh, air access if as a last resort we have to do that. And I'm able to confirm that the continued high altitude airdrops into Deir Zor, where there is no land access, the besieged numbers of people, about 100,000 or so um, in uh, Deir Zor, surrounded by uh, ISIL, uh, it continues. High altitude airdrops to Foa and Kafraya because the topography of that makes that possible, uh, are also being uh, put in uh, place. The air bridge to Kamishli to cover the needs into Hasake uh, continues to be um, uh, operationalized and approval has been given for that by the government of Syria. But helicopters, deliveries uh, and to other besieged locations in and around uh, uh, Damascus and Homs uh, remain uh, very much uh, the uh, the plans that we have in place should ground access not be available. Um, I was also asked in particular about the June and July um, uh, supplies, and I'm pleased to say that uh, the, in terms of the June plan contents, uh, the interagency convoy plan for the month of June, uh, we, this was submitted on the 19th of May last month. It includes requests to reach 1.1 million beneficiaries across 34 besieged and hard to reach and priority cross-line locations. On the 5th of June, the UN submitted a written request to the Syrian authorities to reiterate its request for full approval to deliver overland assistance to areas that were partially approved or not approved under that June plan. And it sought also access by air to Daraa, Duma, Muadamir in rural Damascus governorate and to al Ware. Uh, across a line, indeed one which I have crossed myself in the past, in Homs Governorate, uh, should overland access of, to any of these locations not be granted by the 10th of June. And for that, by the 15th of June, uh, the Syrian authorities did grant approval in full to 17 locations. 13 were partially approved by the Syrian authorities, uh, but with restrictions on the type of assistance uh, or a reduction in the number of approved beneficiaries. So that was uh, uh, clearly insufficient and four were not approved, which clearly is unacceptable. Um, they have also approved eight additional locations not requested by the UN, and, and so therefore of the 17 besieged areas requested under the June plan, the UN has approvals to reach 16 of them, either in full or part. And the July plan, I'm pleased to say, has been submitted on uh, last Sunday to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, the 19th of June, a total of 28 requests have been made 
which are intended to reach 1.2 uh, million beneficiaries plus in 35 besieged and hard to reach and across line locations. We await their response and I appreciate the number of member states who urged the government of Syria to give a uh, complete uh, response, a positive response to all 35 and in full. Um, I think the only other uh, point that I ought to add is simply to reaffirm your urging that all besiegements should end instantly. There is no excuse for anybody to be besieging anybody and that is clearly a violation of every law as well as clearly a medieval approach to uh, perpetrating a violence and a fight. And um, I, I end by reiterating that uh, there is no time to lose in making sure that the money that has been pledged to support the people of Syria and in the surrounding countries uh, and in support of host communities, uh, there is no time to lose. Uh, now is the time to convert pledges into cash. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to Under Secretary General Stephen O'Brien for his clear briefing and statement here at the end. I thank members for their participation in this joint briefing. The informal meeting of the plenary is now concluded. The meeting is adjourned. Thank you very much. <laughs>